Jenny and, and, and Richard, a very warm welcome in this round table, which is uh, not very round, it's still virtual, but that's also a pleasure that you are able to, uh, to join this uh, discussion about the community participation linked to affordable and um, sustainable housing, which is a very important topic. And we have a room filled with uh, people that in, in some, some way or form are doing research uh, on that uh, topic. So, so I'm, I'm really delighted to have you in this round table. Um, maybe it's good to have a, a short round of introduction. And maybe Jenny, would you like to start off with that, uh, that round? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, great to be here. My name is Jenny Pickerell and I'm a Professor of Environmental Geography at the University of Sheffield. I specialise in all things environmental, but particularly in the, probably the last 10 to 15 years, I've been working on eco-homes and eco-communities broadly defined, which is a whole mixture of intentional communities, co-housing, uh, low impact developments. I'm particularly interested in how communities have built their own housing, so how they make it affordable, um, and, and therefore who ends up living in these spaces as well. So my, my interest is in how we can make affordable eco-housing, um, and a key part of that has ended up being how that ends up needing to be done um, through communities uh, rather than individually. So I look forward to uh, lots of discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Let's move to Richard. Yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my name is uh, Richard Lang. Uh, I'm a professor of social enterprise and uh, innovative regions in, in Austria um, at Bertha von Suttner Private University, which is just outside Vienna. And um, yeah, so my background is basically in uh, management and also uh, urban regional development and through that um, um, overlap basically I explored and came into um, housing research because I did work on early in my PhD time on, on cooperative organizations and then specialized in housing cooperatives and uh, through that work I developed an interest um, in newer forms of housing cooperatives, um, which we then started to call collaborative housing forms or models. Um, uh, and a really interesting um, emerging um, field for both practitioners and, and researchers. And, and yeah, and I also uh, started a, a working group within the, the ENHR, the European Network for Housing Research, uh, that focuses on, 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 on that particular housing field. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, we didn't agree on any questions beforehand. Eh? I simply sent you an email with uh, the topic of this uh, round table. So maybe the questions I'm going to ask you are, need a bit of improvising, but that also uh, contributes to a lively discussion. You are both very active in the field of collaborative housing, in uh, eco-housing, community participation, are well uh, aware, I think, of recent developments. So, so I'm curious to know uh, if you look at recent developments, maybe things that are emerging, what makes you happy? What makes you sad when you look at community participation, linking it to housing? Jenny, could you start off with trying to address that question? <laughs> I think it touches on something um, Richard and I were very briefly talking about um, as we started, which is what makes me happy is the sheer variety and numbers of different types of projects that are happening. Um, the fact that we can now use lots of different terms uh, from collaborative housing to co-housing to eco-housing and on because there's such variety. So it very much makes me happy in that sense that there are a real growth in the number of communities that are deciding what they want and need from housing and finding different mechanisms to build it. For example, um, in a group that was known as Ouch in um, London, have built co-housing for older women only. Um, so you have to be over 50 to be in it. So quite niche projects are being developed now around 
those very particular needs of um, those different community groups. Um, so I'm quite optimistic that both um, communities can get a be getting to build their own houses and homes as they wish, um, but also because of that, other more formal institutions like in the UK, we have a lot of housing associations that support um, people who are on welfare. And they're increasingly understanding that they need to lead, listen to and work with communities to build housing. So in effect, all that innovation that might have been happening on the margins is now uh, beautifully um, infecting and, and helping some more mainstream forms of housing to be a bit more um, community driven. Thanks. That's a very, very positive uh, view on developments and community participation. Uh, Leandro is... Uh... Ah, yeah, <laughs> kind of note from uh, the, 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 the ones recording. Yeah, okay, thanks, but that's a very positive, um, uh, positive view on developments in the UK, yeah? Yeah, maybe Richard, what are your views on, on, on well, uh, the question was what makes you happy, what makes you sad? Let's, uh, uh, sure, yeah. Um, so I think I'm, I'm sharing uh, the optimism um, in basically um, the capacity of uh, of this of the sector, the collaborative housing sector, and the community-led housing sector um, to address various um, social issues, um, also environmental um, issues that need to be uh, addressed and tackled. Um, I'm. I'm also a bit sad at, at the moment um, because of like the geopolitical environment, the, the war in the Ukraine, and um, which also gives um, collaborative housing again, um, uh, puts it in the spotlight to some extent, because here in Vienna, we have groups um, who already have a tradition in um, accommodating refugees and migrants and Again, that this is a, a huge challenge now for for the entire housing sector here, for, for the social housing sector, for the non-profit housing sector. Um, we don't know what to expect, to be honest, over the next few months and probably years. Um, but I, I believe in in the potential and the capacity of, uh, of, of of the sector and the different projects to come up with um, solutions and also to uh, provide um, some support for um, or during that crisis, crisis that is now unfolding. Um, I guess uh, another challenge that, that, that makes me a bit worried um, is, um, is the rising costs of, of, of housing and land across Europe which makes it hard uh, for uh, groups to develop um, uh, collaborative housing uh, projects. Um, so that puts pressure not only on the groups, but I guess also on, on various partners to um, come up with uh, solutions and to, co to collaborate basically and partner. Um, but of course this requires um, some expectation management, I would say, because there are sometimes unrealistic ex ex expectations what the sector can actually do and, and what it can deliver, um, both on, on the side of the communities, but also um, among policymakers. And I, I also recognize it among larger pro housing providers, social housing providers who have certain um, or have different expectations, sometimes unrealistic. But then there you find also some really um, uh, inspiring uh, managers um, who, who believe in, in, in those models and, uh, um, and have set up partnerships um, which can, can be role models. So some optimism and also some, uh, some skepticism. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And what you also mentioned, uh, Richard, also interested in, in Jenny's uh, views on that, you mentioned also the human aspect, uh, the, the, the inspired managers within housing providers. So how much is community participation depending on inspired 
motivated, empowered people. Is that so the human factor, maybe compared to institutions, regulations? Because uh, um, Jenny, you mentioned that that also, I think the context is also in the UK helping, uh, well, communi community participation and more collaborative housing solutions become mainstream. Eh? So how much is institution, you could say, and how much is people? Is that something you could maybe elaborate on? I would say that um, the, the institutional context is very limiting here in the sense that we also have a housing crisis, we have high land prices, housing is viewed by our politicians as, as a source of profit rather than as homes. So I would say that it, it's, it's institutions like housing associations seeking out those individuals uh, to offer alternatives because otherwise um, they themselves are struggling to provide housing at rates that are affordable um, or, or deliver for the needs. So I think that we are, and this, this is one of the kind of instabilities that we're reliant on certain leading individuals um, that are navigating their way through these systems to provide um, alternatives. Uh, and the problem with that is that, um, eventually they burn out and there's only so much they can do. Um, and there's a really interesting um, dynamic that's happening in a lot of co-housing and eco communities that the founder member, the one that drove through the creation and got the thing built then leaves when it's finished. Um, so it's almost like a very different type of person and energy is required to push these projects into being. Um, and then eventually um, they tend to move on. Well, quite soon, actually, they tend to move on. So I think it's quite individual, re reliant on individuals' drive and innovation and, and um, vision. Uh, and that's a weak link in many ways. Yeah, and what, what you also mentioned that it is maybe sometimes linked to a specific project. So the drive is linked to a project and when the project is delivered, um, that that leading figure moves on, goes to do other things. Uh, so so how about the learning? You would say the how does learning and experience and maybe also networking is captured in 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 this domain? The, the co housing is a co housing network in Britain that's trying to capture the lessons learned from it and has spent quite a lot of effort working with housing associations to make the process easier. Um, there are a lot of barriers um, to collaborative, collaborative housing and, and community participation in collaborative housing um, that require quite a range of skills. So I think the idea is that, um, yes, you need someone with the drive and passion, but you also need um, legal advice and planning advice and those sorts of things. So how can we bring those together in a more supportive way um, that doesn't cost too much as well? Because that's really, I mean, I think housing associations are looking at, at community participation as a way to lower costs. Um, but actually there's quite a lot of inbuilt costs in navigating the system. Mm. So I would say we're not very advanced on, on capturing that learning, but there are various initiatives trying to. Thanks, Jenny. When you look at, at um, Austria, Austria is often referred to as a kind of uh, Valhalla of uh, collaborative housing initiatives, uh, Richard. You are in the middle of that Valhalla. <laughs> maybe, you can, maybe you can tell a bit more about maybe this institutional side or maybe the balance between, I would say, individual driven persons and, and the institutional supportive context. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to, to, to summarize my <clears throat> uh, view on it. Um, yeah, first, um, I, I agree with Jenny that it needs, or, or we are reliant on, on, on certain individuals throughout um, the pro projects, uh, project development, uh, but also in umbrella organizations, in the institutional environment. Um, um, I, I would even say uh, that it needs um, it needs entrepreneurs 
you need social entrepreneurs um, for housing, for, for in innovative uh, housing projects to take off. Uh, it also needs entrepreneurs in existing organizations, such as in, 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 in larger uh, housing providers, social housing providers. Some of them still have uh, quite um, traditional management approaches. Um, and, and, and that is sometimes a barrier to, to promoting um, innovative um, collaborative housing or to partner with groups. Um, so it needs both those uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, I would say, um, also in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the public sector. Um, and um, yeah, uh, yeah, what's happening in Vienna, what is interesting here is um, that, that we probably have a, a more supportive uh, institutional environment uh, in the on the city level compared to experienced in the UK, for example. So um, that basically <clears throat> came down to um, uh, year, some years ago to, to the Green Party joining the local government uh, and, and setting up a coalition government here with the Social Democrats. Uh, and uh, the Greens lobbied for um, um, inclusion of collaborative uh, um, models in, in, in uh, social housing programs in affordable housing programs to provide them with, um, with access to um, affordable land within those developer competitions that, uh, that the Social Democrats had already set up uh, earlier, uh, quite an innovative instrument. Um, and uh, but still, there are there are certain um, <clears throat> conf conflicting views, I would say, um, <clears throat> uh, within government and within uh, the institutional environment. Because when you talk to to some social democrats, um, they are not entirely convinced uh, that the collaborative model um, <clears throat> can really deliver on uh, affordable housing uh, and also on um, targeting um, or let's say on, on, on um, ensuring inclusive, inclusive, socially inclusive housing. So some of them still believe that um, it is a model that targets particular middle class groups um, and their question is always why should we fund or subsidize uh, with taxpayer money, why should we subsidize private groups to build um, in, in inner city locations where the land prices are quite high. Um, uh, why should we do that? What is the advantage for uh, urban development more generally? I mean, that's a legitimate question, I guess, <clears throat> that needs to be explored. What would be your answer to the social democrat politician asking that question? <clears throat> um, I guess um, what we can also um, demonstrate with um, some empirical data, um, often um, case study based, of course, that there are uh, na certain neighborhood effects um, that um, result from, from uh, co-housing or collaborative housing that's built in, in the city. Because again, it comes down to the, to, the, um, um, to the groups and the individuals that live there because they they proactively reach out to the wider neighborhood. They have open spaces where you can interact. Um, um, they um, they offer um, again certain flats to uh, vulnerable groups uh, and they, especially for vulnerable groups, I would say uh, the advantage of uh, collaborative housing compared to what I can see here in the municipal housing sector is that the support structures are uh, much more personalized um, for refugees, for um, people um, with um, <clears throat> disabilities. Um, so uh, so that, that is an advantage, of course. But what we, of course, what is, what I also have to admit is it does, it cannot deliver the large numbers that social housing can deliver. And so it is, it needs to be seen. I mean, that, this is my personal opinion now. It needs to be seen as, um, as a certain test bed 
and 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 the, and the a field where you where you can experiment, of course, with new um, organizational uh, models and and elements, which can hopefully be mainstreamed uh, later uh, in, in in the social housing sector, and non-profit housing sector, and uh, it is probably also a kind of uh, intermediate form of housing. Um, that's that's what I see now with uh, the, this refugee target group, for instance, because they have very often they move on to other housing forms. Um, but they get initial support there. So, um, so I, I can clearly see certain functions of, uh, of this sector. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But so I, I will start uh, the, the the perspective of this social democratic politician asking you that question. I, I hear you saying what I hear you saying is that the impact is often indirect. So there are neighborhood effects. And, and these community initiatives uh, can maybe support more vulnerable groups, but that wreck this kind of echo here. I'm not sure how that works, but, um, but not directly. So, so I'm, I'm also looking at Jenny, but are there possibilities to really directly involve the real vulnerable target groups with via community participation or collective housing? There are, but I would also start with one of the concerns that I've been working with um, a variety of groups in the UK around is who is being excluded from these projects. Um, rarely, rarely deliberately, but as the result of a you know a set of dynamics around cost or language in terms of what's expected of people to live in these communities and the very process of participation which can sometimes end up being quite homogenous. And there's a really urgent debate that, that we're having in the UK around how that particularly results in racial exclusion. Um, and that's not just about affordability. It's very much around um, a space where uh, particularly um, black residents feel welcome, feel at home, feel like they, they want to live in a space which is often majority white. Um, and how to work through creating spaces differently from that. So I just want to start from the ground that a lot of the projects I've worked with are actually really struggling with the notion of, of who is excluded. Of course, therefore, there are opportunities to do it differently. Um, through my experience, what's happened is a lot of groups start with great intentions. Um, they start with great intentions to include um, disabled, lower income, uh, local community people, you know, often these projects are set up by people slightly out of the area. And then as the project develops, it becomes somehow easier to drop those commitments. And gradually the, the element of social justice in some of these projects gets dropped in favour of the environmental decisions. So I've seen it in too many projects where they say, well, actually, this is going to cost too much, but we really want to keep the solar panels. So let's drop the number of affordable homes and keep the environmental elements. And I'm sure there are projects that are, are seeking to do that. Um, in Britain, we've struggled. One of the models that I, I have worked with is in the USA, in Portland, Oregon. And they have deliberately sought not just to keep costs down, to keep it as rental rather than purchasing, but to work very closely with the existing community and to minimize who they're moving out of the way. Sorry, my dog's just come say hello. Um, who, they're, who they're trying to move out of, you know, being conscious of the gentrification effect that some of these projects might have actually. Um, while wanting to have a good neighbourhood effect of uh, better housing and, and eco-housing, being careful of the, the, the other side of that in terms of who was initially living in some of those areas. So I don't want to end on a too pessimistic route, but I think it's also really important to kind of name the problem um, and, and to acknowledge where we're at in that. That's a very interesting thing you uh, addressed there. So what are the drivers uh, that, that really lead to maybe um, uh, retaining the environmental sustainability uh, goals, but dropping or well, lowering the social sustainability goals? What, why is that? 
I think it comes down to um, who is in the core group. And a lot of the groups that are setting up the co-housing or eco-communities are white middle class, university educated um, people who, who care about social justice and might campaign for that. You know, there's a strong overlap with activism, but when it comes down to it, uh, would prefer to prioritize the environment. So this might be quite a specific UK thing. Um, I've seen the same happen uh, in Australia, but again, of course, the UK overlaps with Australia in all sorts of historical ways. Uh, and I think the harsh reading of it is they don't care enough about social justice. And there's a homogenizing effect in some of these communities about who ends up living in them and therefore who ends up feeling welcome in them. And therefore who is left to call out some of these priorities. Uh, and I don't mean that in a wholly negative way because maybe you need some of that to create these projects. But I think it's really important to kind of revisit who's not here, who have we excluded either intentionally or accidentally, and, and what responsibility do those housing projects have? Again, I've been having ongoing arguments with some uh, other academics um, who say that these housing projects don't have a responsibility, that those are broader structural issues, that we live in a society with structural racism and they can't solve it all. Uh, I tend to view these projects as a bit more hopeful and full of intent and therefore that we should be trying to do better than conventional society. So I'm not sure I've really answered your question there, but it's certainly something that I think a lot of people are, are struggling with and trying to work through. Yeah, it's very interesting. And also you mentioned this academic debate. It's also very interesting because we all, all, all have uh, lots of uh, young academics in this uh, room. <laughs> But you mentioned also some examples from, you could say, UK, Australia, US. So maybe moving to mainland Europe again, to Richard, what's, what's your perspective on the, the, the dynamic what uh, Jenny just uh, described? Um, I believe that the groups I've been working with um, and the, the models I, I've visited here, um, that those groups that do care uh, about um, uh, social justice, social inclusion aspects. Um, but still those, um, I would call the bottom-up models, are um, resident-led models are extremely demanding for uh, certain resident target groups. And that's why uh, we have to consider other models uh, two alternative models. Um, there are, um, or at least here, we, <clears throat> we have seen um, provider-led models that were popping up, um, which I believe um, have, um, have a lot of potential, especially when we talk about vulnerable groups. So basically, you keep that collaborative uh, element but you make it much less demanding to participate. And um, so other organizations then come into play like social care providers, for instance, we see here, you have uh, intermediate actors um, like sp specialized consultancies, uh, mostly architects or planners that um, interestingly, they have an insight into, um, I would say both worlds. So the world of collaborative housing, because some of them also live in bottom-up project, but then they've, they've also done project management for larger providers, for the municipality. So they can kind of translate between um, different stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> and in, we, in Vienna, we have like, I would say four or five of these um, uh, consultancies that specialize on collaborative housing and are often included in, in project bids um, um, when collaborative models um, um, apply for funding here within developer competitions, um, because they can really break it down um, um, <clears throat> and can really profession also professionalize uh, the, 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 the project and, and carry out project moderation as well. So you need oh. those those intermediate uh, actors, I believe, and in some countries, maybe 
that is still um, a bit missing or needs to be, the market for this needs to be developed, in other words. Um, and um, yeah, well, it also, that also comes down, of course, again, to the, to the public sector and, and to governments, because they need to, 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 um, to realize the advantage um, of, of those models and, and request um, uh, support from, uh, from such organizations, yeah. Do I hear you saying, Richard, that these intermediary organizations exist because they receive support from the government? It's not the sector that is able to sustain. Yeah, you mentioned this this intermediary sector um, yeah. of organizations that really support these community initiatives. But you also mentioned that these organizations are very well depending on government. So I was interested. So how important is government to support these? Um, these intermediary organizations and and what does that support look like? Um, I, I would say that the government uh, sector here and, and local government basically is extremely important um, to to for the growth of this of this particular um, support sector, uh, intermediate sector, but also for collaborative housing in general, because it. It is so much linked to uh, affordable and social housing here. Yeah, maybe there is a different in, in other welfare contexts. Uh, this is different, but in in our more co corporatist uh, welfare context, um, <clears throat> um, local government and regional government uh, plays a very important role in in, in, in housing um, provision, affordable housing provision, and so this link is natural. And um, um, these intermediaries basically um, depend on, on, on funding. Uh, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't survive uh, just on like uh, being, being uh, yeah, ju just depending on projects from the private uh, sector. Um, they have a whole portfolio of, 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 of projects, of course. So, also for commercial builders maybe, but um, when we talk about uh, collaborative and community-led housing, um, in, in, in almost every project I know, uh, government played some, some kind of, uh, of, of role and, 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 and uh, funding, public funding was really important um, to finance it. Um, so it's it's always a multi-actor partnership. What we can see here, it's a partnership between the municipality, between larger social housing providers, uh, those intermediary consultancies, um, resident groups, of course. Um, and there we can see the either, either resident-led projects or the more top-down projects, which I believe um, are more suitable. Uh, when we talk about the about, about social inclusion and 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 how to address vulnerable groups in, in collaborative housing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, so. Jenny. What are your ideas about this the role the role of these provider led initiatives? Oh, I mean, I I, I think that there's lots of opportunity. Um, I I'm particularly interested in in the housing associations, which are often technically private. Some have charity status. Um, but their aim is to provide um, local housing for local communities. Um, I was just noticing the, the huge differences in the UK and um, in, the, in other European contexts. And I think in lots of ways, other European countries are ahead of the UK in this because uh, the government is not very involved. Um, and when it is involved, it tends to be in very piecemeal ways. So either in providing land at slightly below market cost, um, like an like Lilac and Leeds is based on an old school site, for example, or in one-off grants, um, which several of the communities I've worked with have got, but they're just one-off. So it, the provider-led market at the moment is either a housing associations or, or very private profit-driven um, real estate developers that are focusing on um, co-living in, in cities like London, um, which of course is very different to collaborative housing, to co-housing, to eco-housing. 
um, and I'm very critical of co-living. So it, I think it's quite important, um, as Richard's doing, is to identify the different stakeholders we're talking about and their intentions in these projects. So there are those, um, some councils, some housing associations that are interested in how can we do better, more affordable, energy efficient housing uh, for our residents. And there are those private um, developers who see, well, this is a good ruse. We can give them really, really, really small spaces to live in, have a couple of uh, work share rooms and still charge massive rents. So that's still very extractive. So did yeah. living in small house, small homes yeah. and yeah. piecemeal yeah. care yeah. facilities. Yeah. yeah. So, but they like to kind of sell it as if it's similar to co-housing. So we end up with a, a language war. Um, and I end up having to sort of start quite a lot of talks explaining to me what <laughs> good collaborative housing is and what that enables and 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 how that's very different to co-living. Yeah, and, and do, to whom do you need to explain that that difference between real collaborative housing and, and co-living? Um, well, mostly geographers. So not, I mean, housing specialists understand it, but because I come from geography, I speak to quite broad, diverse audiences, sometimes, you know, geographers or sociologists or politics uh, who don't get all the nuances. Um, housing scholars do, uh, but they're not always my audience. <laughs> I understand. Or maybe also you had to talk to local politicians to explain the difference. Uh... Oh, yes, definitely. Um, I think that's also really important as well. Um, but I happen to be in Sheffield, which has, it's trying to build itself as the most climate change resilient city. It's trying to improve its housing stock, etc. So, in fact, this morning I was trying to write a talk that both celebrated, but was also carefully critical of some of the initiatives that, that city councils get involved in on that level. Um, so we always have to, for me, I always want to make sure I'm looking behind any potential greenwash yeah. and we look at what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clear. I want to come back to, to Richard's comment about the real nice distinction between social entrepreneurs, sorry, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. But then you mentioned a very rich landscape of all kinds of organizations collaborating together. So I was wondering, where do I find the entrepreneurs and where do I find the entrepreneurs? And, and is there a link between the two or can the entrepreneurs create entrepreneurs? Interested in this dynamic, maybe you can share maybe examples of, of, of your own experience. Uh, sure, yeah, <laughs> I'll try to. Um, <clears throat> so the most obvious um, social entrepreneurs um, I found in um, bottom-up resident-led uh, co-housing projects where you have um, pr promoters, could be uh, one individual or two or three uh, um, people, who really drive the project um, and um, as an entrepreneur is defined um, they have to take a lot of risk so <laughs> it's the risk taking makes them entrepreneurs uh, of course the innovation also plays a major role so they have an innovative idea um, and then they reconfigure resources so i'm coming back to this champiterian uh, um, definition of entrepreneurship um, um, the, the, the configuration of resources or reconfiguration, basically, that is an inno innovative task. Um, and that's what, um, what you find in some of the projects. Um, <clears throat> and um, entrepreneurs, um, I guess you find them in, um, in, in larger, at, at larger housing providers, um, certain managers, um, but also in, in, um, in local government, in, in particular, um, in the housing department, for instance, there are individuals um, who are, um, who are um, 
convinced of, um, of the collaborative, of the potential that collaborative models uh, have and what they could deliver. And they, 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 those are the ones that um, support uh, partnerships and, and certain um, yeah, collaboration structures, I guess. And so you find, you find those in the public sector as well as in the nonprofit sector. And it can be, as you say, the link between those, I guess it can be stimulated in a sense. So um, entrepreneurs, um, um, often <laughs> those are also very charismatic people, <laughs> as we know, um, they, they, they are able to convince uh, uh, individuals from other sectors, managers and, 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 and policymakers and, um, yeah, and stakeholders uh, of certain ideas. And then there is, uh, there is some exchange going on and, 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 and stimulation in that sense. So, so there is a link between those concepts. Yeah, but these entrepreneurs do not run any risk. Is that what I understood correctly in your definition? They do different things, these entrepreneurs. They maybe are gatekeepers or networkers or uh, supporters of initiatives. Uh, entrepreneurs are, um, I don't have a, 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 a definition now at hand here, but entrepreneurs, my understanding is that they are kind of change makers within existing organizations. So they, they also run risks because they, um, they initiate change processes or transformation processes. And if those fail, I don't know, I, they might risk their, their jobs or <laughs> their reputation within those organizations. Um, and also when they get involved in, in, in projects, um, for instance, when they partner with a, a collaborative housing group, uh, one of the risks I encountered was um, if you have a, a really tailored project, which is really tailored to the needs of the residents living there. Um, and after several years of development, the project fails for some reason, because residents have moved on, because they had immediate housing need, uh, financial um, uh, risks. Um, what, what, what can you do with the project? Um, is it, can you, can you resell it on the market? Uh, this is one of the risks that I encounter talking to housing managers of housing providers um, when they get involved. Um, and they want to make sure that uh, they minimize, for instance, that risk so that the, 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 the collaborative housing project could be reused, um, um, or parts of it at least. Um, on the other hand, I think they could also minimize the maintenance costs if you have a, a, um, a good group that can self-organize um, and is efficient uh, in, in, in self-management. So there are pros and cons for them as well. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'm, I'm now ashamed that I said that these entrepreneurs do not run any risk. You can say they run the major risk, eh? long-term risk uh, of, uh, of this huge investment. Yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, not sure it's so so i'm i'm exploring this difference between entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs jenny is that something this difference is that something that makes sense is also in your context or does it look different i think it i, I think it makes sense in the uk i think though i'm also at the limits of my um my knowledge actually uh, just to be um honest which is that i've I predominantly work with resident led projects um, and they're predominantly interested in doing it on their own self build. Um, and so it, in that sense, um, I've worked less with um, those who are in more formal organizations are interested in supporting it or even provider led. That, that said, the, the comment around um, risk of failure is very high. Um, and the process is quite long, um, especially for co-housing. And so there's a high, a high dropout rate and a high, a high level of projects that never make it. Um, and we, I worked with a housing activist a few years ago to try and identify why so many projects failed, uh, hoping therefore to 
see what structures we could put in place to support them. And ultimately, and perhaps not surprisingly, most of it was um, down to personalities um, and the, the uh, intergroup dynamics of those trying to set these up, that they would have numerous, numerous meetings that eventually exhausted each other. Um, and then new people would join and they would have to reinvent and re-agree what the core principles of the project were. So the projects that were successful tended to have that social entrepreneur to push it through. Um, and the ones that were less successful, in effect, uh, didn't have a leader, didn't, were a bit more um, consensus based and, and they just kept going in circles. So I, I'm not sure I can comment so much on the other elements, but the risk of failure, I think is quite high in these projects. But you also mentioned a very interesting element that although there are grassroots initiatives somehow to be successful, these grassroots initiatives need, need leadership. It, it raises really interesting questions around leadership. Um, in effect, some of the most famous projects in the UK that I've certainly seen develop have had extremely charismatic, charismatic um, dominant leaders that have pushed through problems to the point where the project gets done. Um, that might be why they end up leaving because they've had to push through a lot of conflict um, and make decisions. But um, that has that has happened. So what I think there's some really interesting questions about what leadership means in these types of projects and, and how they get enacted. Great. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, what I would like to suggest is that we have a, a short break, a 10 minute break until um, three. Uh, so again, grab, grab a cup of coffee and stretch our legs, then return. I will also ask the audience to maybe uh, add uh, questions. I uh, also would like to explore with you the role of community participation in doing research. Uh, is there, uh, how can you combine the two? But first, uh, a short break and looking forward to seeing you again at three. Okay.